Okay, uh, you'll remember uh, uh, before the exam we were discussing uh, the Deuteronomy's conception of history, right? That for, is uh, for Deuteronomy, Israel's past was a succession of uh, acts of disobedience, right? That was its whole point in recalling Israel's history through the wilderness. Um, God was willing to forgive all of that disobedience in the wilderness and make this new covenant in the plains of Moab. Uh, but it was also clear right from the end of Deuteronomy that God fully expects Israel to continue disobeying. Right? You were disobedient in the past. How much more so, Moses says, will you be in the future? And the costs of disobedience are made clear in this long set of curses in Deuteronomy 28. Um, and then right, God uh, says to Moses something like, you know, tell the people, right, when you have disobeyed, this is what will happen to you. So there's clearly uh, a sense that they will. The uh, essential notion of uh, Dee's historical view is that Israel's history, past, present, and future, is one of disobedience and punishment and repentance. But this cycle has its limits. God will be forgiving only for so long. And eventually, God will crack, and the people will really be punished. Right? Not like they were in the wilderness, but like real bad. And the only way to avoid such an outcome is, of course, to obey the laws, right? the laws which Deuteronomy lays out for us. And the most important of these laws, as we saw, was the law of centralization of worship, right? No worshiping of foreign gods and no worshiping anywhere other than Jerusalem, right? Though Deuteronomy doesn't say Jerusalem, it just says the place where God chooses uh, to put God's name. So no worshiping foreign gods and no worshiping outside of uh, Jerusalem. Uh, this is the, the biggest deal that Deuteronomy uh, has for us. And, and this is, um, you know, again, this, this is the law that is at the center of this historical scheme. Uh, but Deuteronomy itself, of course, is not a history of Israel. Right? It is a theological program. It lays out the parameters. Uh, it is, some might say, a, it's sort of a constitution. Uh, as some scholars have, have put it, it's certainly an ideological statement. Right? This is how history and theology work together. Uh, Deuteronomy talks about and uses examples from Israel's semi-mythic past, and it predicts the future to a certain extent, but it doesn't really work it out. Right? Th that task, the task of actually historically working out Deuteronomy's theological program, is what we have in what we call the Deuteronomistic history. So what is this Deuteronomistic history? Um, it is, in biblical terms, everything we're going to read for the rest of the semester. Right? Joshua, Judges, Samuel, and Kings. Uh, in terms of content, it is the history of Israel from the conquest of Canaan through the middle of the exile in the early 6th century BCE. In conceptual terms, it's an attempt to explain the history of Israel through the lens of Deuteronomy's ideology. In compositional terms, it's a blend of different sources, surprise, surprise, overlaid with a distinct editorial voice, that is the voice of what we call the Deuteronomistic historian. Uh, and what I want to do today as we begin this uh, second part of the semester, is give you an introduction to each of these sort of facets of the Deuteronomistic history, uh, so that as you begin reading for next time and throughout the rest of the semester, you have some idea what it is that you're looking at. Okay. So the biblical books uh, that constitute the Deuteronomistic history, this is going to happen to me, like, I, I'm amazed I made it this far. Uh, we have to distinguish, by the way, between what we call things that are Deuteronomic, having to do with Deuteronomy, and things that are Deuteronomistic, right? Like, it's not Deuteronomy, it's like, it's like Deuteronomish, <laughs> ick, right? Deuteronomistic, right? It, it's like Deuteronomy, it's based on Deuteronomy, but it's not. So the Deuteronomistic history, right? As opposed to Deuteronomic laws, say. But I'm gonna stumble Deuteronomistic. I'm pretty good at it, I've had practice, but it's still, you know, it's one of those words. 
The biblical books that constitute the Deuteronomistic history are, as I said, Joshua, Judges, Samuel, and Kings. Right? Uh, you'll remember, of course, that in the Pentateuch, the names we use for the books and the Hebrew names are different. Not so in the Deuteronomistic history. The Hebrew names are the same. Uh, we call them Joshua, Judges, Samuel, and Kings. They're probably in Hebrew. Uh, uh, in part, the, the names are the same because the contents of the books are so well delineated. The book of Joshua covers the entire tenure of Joshua's leadership of Israel. The book of Judges covers the period in which Israel, Israel was ruled by a series of judges. The book of Samuel begins with Samuel's birth, but it doesn't actually end with Samuel's death. Samuel dies before the end of 1 Samuel, actually. Uh, where Samuel ends is with the end of David's reign in Israel. Uh, but since David was anointed by Samuel, this is also the end, as it were, of Samuel's legacy. And the book of Kings begins with the reign of Solomon and covers all of the kings of Israel and Judah, except for the two uh, that came before Saul and David. Uh, you will uh, obviously note that uh, Samuel and Kings are each divided into two books, 1st and 2nd Samuel and 1st and 2nd Kings. These divisions are meaningless, really. Uh, there's no break in the storyline between 1st and 2nd Samuel or 1st and 2nd Kings. Uh, there are some like general demarcations in content, right? Saul dies at the end of 1st Samuel. Elijah dies at the beginning of 2nd Kings. Um, but what we have here is basically the same phenomenon we had in the Pentateuch, which is to say uh, it's a question of scroll length. The books of Samuel and Kings were simply too long to fit on single scrolls. Um, so they divided them up. And as with the Pentateuch, they divided them in you know, reasonably logical moments uh, somewhere in the middle of their stories. Uh, but we, we ought to note that the division between Samuel and Kings is also like a little bit messy. Uh, David doesn't actually die at the end of 1 Samuel. He dies in 1 Kings 2. Uh, there is this clear continuity, therefore, in the story between Samuel and Kings, as we'll see. Uh, given that, it's not so surprising, perhaps, that uh, in the Septuagint, right, the Greek translation of the Hebrew Bible, all of Samuel and Kings are simply called reigns uh, and are divided into four books, first, second, third, and fourth reigns, which match exactly first and second Samuel and first and second Kings but they are recognizing the continuity of the story uh, from, from start to finish there. Now, even though there are four separate books, Joshua, Judges, Samuel, and Kings, we should remember we do have basically the same situation that we had in the Pentateuch, which is to say these four books were really four volumes, six volumes, of a single history, right? The Deuteronomistic history, which is continuous from Joshua through Kings, though is a little complicated, as we will see presently. So that's what uh, we have in terms of like the books and the, and the text. Uh, what does it cover in terms of history, this Deuteronomistic history? It begins precisely, whoops, there's the Deuteronomistic history. It begins precisely where the Pentateuch left off. Joshua 1.1 says, after the death of Moses, the servant of the Lord. Right, okay, cool. That's like right where we were a second ago at the end of Deut uh, Deuteronomy. Um, Joshua, of course, in Mo upon Moses' death, is now leader of the Israelites, and Joshua directs the conquest of Canaan. And that covers uh, Joshua 2 through 14, which contains a lot of battles and destruction uh, and this section is clearly marked off by its concluding statement, right? And the land had rest from war. And that's the end of Joshua's conquest story. Uh, after uh, the conquest is, uh, is finished, the land becomes div is divided up among the various tribes in truly some of the least riveting material in the entire Bible. If you thought that the genealogies in Genesis were boring, who boy, uh, at least they had peoples in them. Uh, you know, you'd need a, a, an atlas and a better one than we have to figure out, you know, and the border runs from here to here to, to, for chapter. It's just the worst. Okay. Um, that's Joshua 15 through 22, uh, most of which will be on the exam. Um, uh, finally, uh, <laughs> uh, last things like, uh, 
which, to which tribe does Abel bet Ma'aka belong? And you'll have to, no. Um, that's not how this works. That'll be an essay question. Uh, okay. Uh, that's 15 to 22. Finally, when Joshua's work of dividing up the land is completed, uh, Joshua gives his final words to the Israelites. Uh, that's these two lovely speeches of Joshua 23 and 24. And the book ends with the death of Joshua. Joshua, the son of Nun, the servant of the Lord, died at the age of 110 years, uh, which is uh, precisely how old Joseph was. Why did I say that? Because it was there. Okay. Um, that's the book of Joshua. The book of Judges picks up in turn precisely where Joshua left off after the death of Joshua. Right, so we can see, see what we're doing here. Um, but the story begins in Judges 1, oddly enough, with the failure of Israel to fully conquer Canaan, uh, despite what we just read in Joshua. Uh, and this is a problem I will discuss at length when we get there. Uh, it then tells us in Judges 2 that the Israelites disobeyed God's laws, particularly the laws about interacting with the Canaanites and worshiping their deities. In other words, as predicted, as soon as they conquer the land, right, as soon as they are settled, there go the Israelites again, right, which again is precisely what Moses says in Deuteronomy, right, uh, not, I'm worried about what's going to happen to you between now when I'm talking and when you uh, conquer the land. Right? That's going to happen like in the next couple of days. But once you've settled, that's when you're going to forget about God and you're going to turn to your neighbors, God, deities, and all that. That's the prediction of Deuteronomy, and that's precisely what we see in, in Judges. Uh, and virtually all of Judges proceeds, proceeds from this uh, initial statement that the Israelites did what was offensive. The Israelites and judges are subjected to foreign rule by God's will uh, for a period of time. And then when they repent, God gives them a leader called a judge to rescue them. And Judges 3 through 16 are the stories of those uh, judges. Some of them you've probably heard of because they have lengthy stories. People like Deborah or Gideon or dare I say, Samson. Um, some have fairly significant stories, but you may not have heard of them. Uh, Ehud, who's famous for stabbing a fat man on the toilet. Um, that's in there. Uh, uh, Yotam, maybe you've heard of Jephthah or Jephthah's daughter. That's a pretty famous one. And some of the judges in these chapters get about three lines, and neither you nor I have ever heard of them. Uh, Otniel and Shamgar, and Tola, and Yair, and Ibzan, and Elon, and who could forget Abdon, right? They, these are not, right, these are three-line judges. Regardless, though, of the length and detail of the stories that are told about them, the basic outline is always the same. The Israelites screw up, they get conquered, they repent, they get saved, rinse and repeat. And the final chapters of Judges, chapters 17 through 21, are about some inner Israelite conflicts. And these stories are marked by this repeated phrase, in those days there was no king in Israel, every man did as he pleased, which is setting us up for what's coming next. As it turns out, much of Judges actually has the question of kingship in mind, as we'll discuss next week. Um, but here... The issue is clearly that without a leader, Israel starts infighting, which pretty much leads into Samuel, who will anoint the first kings of Israel. Uh, the book of Samuel uh, begins with the birth and youth of Samuel in 1 Samuel 1 through 3, and then it turns to the story of the Ark, right, the Ark of the Covenant, which is captured by the Philistines and eventually brought back to Israel. Uh, and that story takes up 1 Samuel 2 through 7. And then the question of kingship comes up, perhaps triggered by those pesky Philistines. The people ask Samuel to appoint a king over them. And we have a famous, uh, a relatively famous debate over whether Israel should even have a king in 1 Samuel 8. And 1 Samuel uh, 9 through 12 gives us the story of Saul becoming the first king of Israel. 
And Saul's kingship, for good or bad, is narrated in 1 Samuel 13 through 15, and David is introduced in 1 Samuel 16 through 17, which includes the story of Goliath. And the rest of the book, chapters 18 through 31, tells of the conflict between Saul and David as Saul's power diminishes and David's grows. And 2 Samuel begins with David learning of the death of Saul in 2 Samuel 1. And then 2 Samuel 2 through 4 tells us of David's rise to the kingship and his struggle against the house of Saul, right? Saul's descendants. Uh, David's reign lasts from 2 Samuel 5 through 1 Kings 2. And this includes various wars, the bringing of the ark to Jerusalem, the episode of Bathsheba, the revolt of Absalom, other events, I'll go through it all in detail when the time comes. Solomon's reign begins in 1 Kings 2 and lasts until 1 Kings 11. And that covers the construction of the temple in Jerusalem and the description of Solomon's wisdom, the visit of the Queen of Sheba, and the revolt of Jeroboam. And from that point forward, from the revolt of Jeroboam on, there is no longer one Israel, and there is no longer one united monarchy, which lasted us for a total of two generations. There are now two kingdoms. There is the northern kingdom of Israel and the southern kingdom of Judah, and you will see how much space I've left on the screen for what's about to happen next. Um, the narrative from this point on bounces back and forth between the northern king stories that take place in the northern kingdom of Israel and stories that take place in the southern kingdom of Judah. Our book is telling us these two histories at once, and they only sometimes intersect. So... 1 Kings 12 through 14 describes the reign of Jeroboam in Israel and Solomon's son Rehoboam in Judah. 1 Kings 15 describes the reigns of the Judahite kings Abiam and Asa and the Israelite kings Nadav and Basha. 1 Kings 16 tells of a succession of Israelite kings Elah and Zimri and Omri and Ahab. And that's when we hear about the prophet Elijah who works during the reign of Ahab. That's 1 Kings 17 through 19. The reign of Ahab resumes in 1 Kings 20 to 22, along with the Judahite king Jehoshaphat. 2 Kings 1 through 2 picks up with the reign of Ahab's son Ahaziah and the transition from Elijah to Elisha. Uh, the prophets also with their annoyingly similar names. Uh, in 2 Kings 3, Jehoram takes over as king of Israel. 2 Kings 4 through 8 are stories about the prophet Elisha. Meanwhile, Joram has become king of Judah <laughs> and is succeeded by Ahaziah. Uh, 2 Kings 9 through 10 then give us the reign, uh, the revolt of Jehu, who killed Jehoram, king of Israel, and Ahaziah, king of Judah. In 2 Kings 11, we learn what happened in Judah when Jehu became king in Israel. The queen mother, Atalia, took over and killed everyone of royal blood, uh, but her grandson, Joash, was secretly saved and eventually became king, and Atalia gets a real good death scene. Um, uh, Joash's reign covers 2 Kings 11 through 12, while Jehoahaz became king of Israel and Elisha died. Uh, now, a, uh, that's Jehoahaz. Uh, now, a different Joash, uh, the son of Jehoahaz, becomes king of Israel, and Amaziah, son of the first Joash, becomes king of Judah. Y'all with me? <laughs> cool. Uh, Joash of Israel was succeeded by Jeroboam II. Uh, they didn't make that easy on us. Uh, now we've gotten through 2 Kings 13 through 14. Uh, in 2 Kings 15, Azariah becomes king of uh, Judah, who is succeeded by Yotam, who is succeeded uh, by Ahaz. Uh, and Azariah, just to keep us on our toes, is also called Uzziah. While Zechariah takes over in Israel from Jeroboam II, and Zechariah is killed by Shalom, and Shalom is killed by Menachem, and is succeeded by his son, Pekahia, who is killed by Hosea. You can see that in the north they had trouble with their royal dynasties, which is something that we'll talk about in detail later on. But you might also note, if you've been following along with how fast I've been doing this, that in, this, in the south, in Judah, uh, they're all, uh, it's all one line of uh, descendants of David. Uh, it's all, uh, they're all genealogically, right? Nobody's killing off anybody, and if they are, uh, they're preserving the line somehow. Uh, 2 Kings 16 tells us about the reign of Ahaz in Judah. 2 Kings 17 is an extremely important chapter. 
because it describes the conquest of the northern kingdom by Assyria and the deportation of its inhabitants to Mesopotamia. And from this point forward, there is no northern kingdom anymore. There is just Judah. So in 2 Kings 18, Hezekiah becomes king of Judah, and his reign, which is the most important in Judah since Solomon, is described in 2 Kings 18 through 20. We're going to pay lots of attention to Hezekiah in the weeks to come. And in 2 Kings 21, Hezekiah's son Manasseh takes over, followed by his son Ammon. But in 2 Kings 22, Josiah becomes king, and he's even more important than Hezekiah. And he rules until 2 Kings 23, when he's succeeded by his son Jehoahaz. And the king of Egypt, uh, who takes over at some point, replaces Jehoahaz with Jehoiakim, who is Josiah's other son. So we're keeping the Davidic line intact. And in 2 Kings 24, Jehoiakim is succeeded by his son Jehoiakim. You guys are going to have the best final exam ever. <laughs> I'm kidding. Uh, it's, I'm, I'm kidding, it's going to be terrible. Um, no, this, I'm, I'm not going to make you reproduce this or any part of it. Though you should, this is a good thing to keep in the back of your pocket or in the front of the Collins textbook where I think it probably also is. Um, uh, Jehoiakim is attacked by Nebuchadnezzar, uh, king of Babylon, and deported along with the rest of Judah's elite and is replaced by his uncle, Zedekiah. And Zedekiah evidently not being such a smarty pants, decides in 2 Kings 25, he's going to rebel against uh, the Babylonians. And this brings about the final blow as the Babylonians attack Judah, destroy the temple, and exile, according to the Bible, the entire Judahite populace, certainly their elites. And the book of Kings ends with the image of the rightful Judahite king, Jehoiachin, in exile in Babylon. It's a cheery book, this one. And that's the content of what is covered in the Deuteronomistic history. Now, uh, in conceptual terms, as I said earlier, what we have in the Deuteronomistic history as a whole, uh, there's the fall of the Southern Kingdom I forgot about. Uh, in conceptual terms, what we have in the Deuteronomistic history as a whole is the working out of Deuteronomy's theology in historical terms. In the book of Joshua, for the most part, the people are obedient and all goes well. But right from the beginning of Judges, right when they no longer have their leader, there's no Moses, there's no Joshua. Right from the beginning of Judges, the people begin to disobey. And we get these cycles of disobedience and punishment and repentance and rescue. Once there are kings in Israel, they are each judged on the basis of how well they conform to the laws. Right? Once we have kings, it's not the people as a whole who are disobeying and sinning. It's just the king. This is one of the risks of having a king. Right? God judges the nation based on royal policy. Those of who are American know what that feels like when you travel abroad. Um, so the kings are judged mostly on basis of that law about worshiping foreign deities and centralizing worship in Jerusalem. As I said, that was the thing that D cares most about, and that is the, the law on which um, the law that the people disobey in Judges, and that's the law that the kings disobey or not uh, in the Book of Kings. And basically, in Kings, every king gets a scorecard at the end of their reign. And in the north they generally tend not to get good grades. Uh, in part because, as we saw some time ago, the first king of the northern kingdom, Jeroboam, established alternate sites of worship in Bethel and Dan, right? The golden calves. These are your gods, O Israel. Right? And basically, every king in the north thereafter kept those two sites up, and so Deuteronomy thinks they're all crap. Now, they all get bad grades. I mean, it probably doesn't help that clearly the person who was writing this was living in the South and was like, didn't like the North. But still, if you're going to say centralization of worship is what I'm grading on, the North is always going to be in trouble because they're always going to have these uh, non-Jerusalem sanctuaries. Not surprisingly, the Northern Kingdom's iniquity, 
according to this uh, history, catches up with it eventually, and the kingdom is destroyed and its people are exiled, as I said. And the chapter where this happens in 2 Kings 17 couldn't be more clear about why, the why of the destruction. It was precisely because they didn't obey the law. In the south, in Judah, even though there aren't alternative cultic sites, some kings stray from the path and are judged negatively, including Solomon. And the worst of these sinning Judahite kings is Manasseh, the son of Hezekiah, great king, grandfather of Josiah, great king. And even though Josiah is the greatest of all the kings since Solomon, if not since David, the sins of Manasseh are so powerful that even Josiah's greatness cannot overcome them. And as a result, Judah too is destroyed and exiled. So history in the Deuteronomistic history is nothing less than the realization in fact of the predictions of Deuteronomy. The Israelites are in fact attacked and defeated by foreigners, as in Judges. And the Israelites are, in fact, conquered by a foreign nation and exiled. And the Deuteronomistic history repeatedly reminds its audience who are living in the exile that none of this should have been a surprise. They knew the rules. They broke the rules. They knew what would happen when they broke the rules. And that's precisely what happened. That's the conceptual framework. You'll see this worked out over and over, and we'll talk about it. So what's the status of the Deuteronomistic history in compositional terms, literary terms? The Deuteronomistic historian, whom we might refer to as the author of this work, was a collector and an editor, and took texts from a wide range of sources, some of which we already know, J, E, P. Some of his sources we get the names of, the annals of the kings of Israel, the annals of the kings of Judah, texts that are referred to in the text itself. Some texts uh, are clearly used, but not named, say. Uh, there's a pretty good case to be made that the boundary list in, uh, in the book of Joshua, impenetrably awful as it is, was probably an, perhaps an independent uh, literary unit that was taken up. The historian used sources, but did not simply put those texts, his sources down and be done with it. Uh, he edits his texts. Uh, the historian picks and chooses is pick, I couldn't decide what, what tense I was gonna use there. Uh, picked and chose, or picks and chooses, you choose, or chose. Um, uh, the, the historian picked and chose, I'm going to go past tense, picked and chose what stories were useful for the making of his point. But he has such a clear conceptual agenda. What works for that? The historian rewrites parts of his sources to reflect his own ideology. The historian adds passages that present his historical theological ideas in the plainest possible terms. The historian shapes the whole. You'll note that that's very different from what we had in the Pentateuch, right? In the Pentateuch, the sources were treated with reverence, right? Every word retained in their original order. In the history, there is no such concern for the sanctity of the sources. In the Pentateuch, the compiler, the person who put these together, virtually never inserts his own voice into the text. I don't know what the compiler thought about anything. In the, in the Deuteronomistic history, the historian is constantly present and before us. I know exactly what the historian wants me to do with this material. Even when it's contradictory, I know exactly what the point is supposed to be. And you will too, right? Because he's not shy about saying it. What that means compositionally though, is that whereas in the Pentateuch, because the texts are treated reverently and are retained in pristine form, I can tell them apart, right? I can see the lines. I can read a flood story and be like, this can't be that. That's not, right, like that's not how things work. Uh, 
But in the, his, in the history, in the Deuteronomistic history, it is frequently difficult, if not impossible, to clearly identify any given text as being from the historian's sources or perhaps from the historian himself. Right? Again, this is the difference between a compiler in the Pentateuch and an editor in the history. On the other hand, the fact that the historian used sources does mean that sometimes his text is contradictory or repetitive, just as is the case in the Pentateuch, as we'll see. Um, so you'll come across things, in, in fact, stories that I'm sure you never thought twice about uh, have problems in them, like the Goliath story, for instance. Um, the David's story is full of repetition. But for the most part, uh, despite, uh, despite the existence of contradictions and repetitions, we in this class are going to talk about the Deuteronomistic, his mm, the Deuteronomistic history as a whole. We're going to talk about it as a whole. Uh, since the entire work was consciously shaped by this uh, ancient historian um, and theologian. Which doesn't mean we were not going to point out and notice contradictions in sources, but we're not going to do the same kind of reading here that we were doing uh, in the Pentateuch. Uh, and one of the most important things to realize is that the Deuteronomic document, D, uh, is the crucial ideological statement for the Deuteronomistic history. Not just in th theoretical terms, but in literary terms also. That is, it seems to me more likely than not that the first book of the Deuteronomistic history was in fact D. That it stood at the head of the history as sort of the conceptual guide for everything that followed. And this may be a little bit hard to picture at first, so bear with me. The independent D document, as I've said, existed uh, independently, right, before it was compiled with J and E and P into the Pentateuch. So somebody writes this, you know, this ideological constitutional law code with its historical framework, with its, you know, whole idea about Israel's uh, sin and punishment, this thing we call D. And here it is out there in the world. And it now gets used in two distinct ways, right? Uh, it was taken up as the introduction to a history that was written on the basis of it and only it, right? With no sense of J or, or, e, or e or P, right? Uh, the Deuteronomistic history is writing, um, uh, at least, you know, with a sense of J and E or P, but not based on them conceptually, right? Uh, the histor historian takes D and says, I'm going to understand history through the lens of this ideological statement. And D was also, the independent D was also taken up as the conclusion of a major legal work, which is to say, the Pentateuch. Right? So one text being used as the beginning of one thing and as the end of a separate thing. Which makes D, Deuteronomy, right, the fulcrum, the axis of everything we're reading this semester. Right? It was crucial to both the historian and to the compiler. Because D does two things at once. It contains laws, which makes it crucial for the Pentateuch, for the Torah. And it contains the historical ideology looking forward. So it's necessary for the historian trying to understand what happened. So the Deuteronomistic history is, uh, as a whole, not surprisingly, a complex work. But we have the rest of the semester to uh, figure out what's going on in there in some detail.